I'm Josh Escovito with Weintraub Tobin. And I'm Scott Hervey with Weintraub Tobin. Netflix finds itself mired in yet another defamation and false light lawsuit. This one brought on by its portrayal of Rachel Williams, the Vanity Fair photo editor whose friendship with Anna Delvey, who passed herself off as German heiress Anna Sorkin, was the subject of the Netflix series Inventing Anna. Williams' complaint raises some interesting questions about the portrayal of Williams in the program. We are going to discuss this lawsuit on this next installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. Rachel Williams does not come across well in the Netflix program Inventing Anna. Rather, Williams comes across as a privileged freeloader who sponges off a Sorkin and then abandons Sorkin when her real situation comes to light. So let's talk about what Williams will have to establish in order to move forward with her claim. Williams brings claims for defamation and false light. For her defamation claim, Williams will have to establish that the statements were defamatory, that the statements were published to third parties, that the statements were false, and that it was reasonably understood by third parties that the statements were of and about her. Since Williams is a public figure, she published a story in Vanity Fair and a book about her experiences with Sorkin, she must also prove by clear and convincing evidence that the statement was made with actual malice, meaning that the defendant knew the statement was false or had serious doubts about the truth of the statements. In most states, libel is defined similarly. A false light claim is a type of invasion of privacy claim, and it's based on publicity that places a person in the public eye in a false light that would be highly offensive to a reasonable person and where the defendant knew or acted in reckless disregard as to the falsity of the publicized matter and the false light in which the aggrieved person would be placed. A false light claim is equivalent to a libel claim, and its requirements are basically the same as a libel claim, including proof of malice. So in order for Williams to prevail on both her false light claim and her defamation claim, she will have to demonstrate that her portrayal in inventing Anna were, uh, were assertions of fact uh, actually false or create a false impression about her, were highly offensive to a reasonable person or defamatory, and were made with actual malice. Actual malice would be established by showing that Netflix deliberately portrayed Williams in the hope of insinuating a defamatory import to the viewer, or that Netflix knew or acted in reckless disregard as to whether her portrayal would be interpreted by the average viewer as a defamatory statement of fact. So, Josh, let's take a look at the various portrayals of Williams she claims to be actionable. So, William notes, uh, and by the way, the complaint is... I mean, it's very, very, very detail-oriented, replete with references to specific scenes. Uh, so we're just going to cover a handful of them, not all of them. So William notes a scene in episode two where Sorkin's friend, Neff Davis, states or implies that Williams used to be Sorkin's best friend, but Williams dropped her as a friend because she was jailed and could not pay for Williams' social life and clothing. Williams claims that these scenes are false. Williams claims that she was friend with, friends with Sorkin because she liked her, not because Sorkin would pick up the tab. And she did not drop jo Sorkin as a friend because Sorkin was no longer able to pay for her social life and clothing, but rather because she discovered that Sorkin had made the fraudulent statements and promises which induced Williams to incur significant liabilities. And that Sorkin, at least according to the complaint, was, well, and according to Sorkin's criminal trial, and Sorkin was a liar and a con artist. Uh, also, um, Williams claims that Sorkin never bought clothing, shoes, earrings, or bags as a gift for Williams, that Williams never wore Sorkin's clothing or accessories, and never told Neff that Sorkin bought Williams her clothes. William claims that these statements are defamatory because Williams is portrayed falsely as a disloyal and opportunistic friend, a sponger and a freeloader. There are other scenes referenced by Williams which portray Williams as a freeloader or a false friend. For example, a scene in episode five where Williams is portrayed in attempting to convince Sorkin to pay for an expensive hairstyle for Williams, and a scene in episode six where Williams is portrayed trying to get Sorkin to pay for a more expensive hotel in Morocco. Williams claims that this scene is false and never happened. 
Williams never tried to get Sorkin to pay for an expensive hairstylist for her, and Sorkin never paid for her hair. Also, Sorkin made the arrangements with the hotel herself, and Williams did not make any suggestions to her about the accommodations there. Williams also takes offense to her being portrayed in the program as not paying for any dinner, drinks, or spa outings with Sorkin. Williams claims that this wrongfully portrays her as a freeloader. In the complaint, Williams claims that she regularly played, paid her way. In the complaint, Williams also takes issue with the scene in episode six where she is portrayed as abandoning Sorkin in Morocco. After the scene depicting the problems with the credit cards at the hotel and at the private museum tour, Williams tells Anna, who was alone in her room drinking heavily and depressed, that she is leaving. Sorkin begs her not to leave, but Williams leaves anyways. According to the complaint, uh, this never happened. According to the complaint, Williams had a pre-existing business meeting in France, and Williams had told Sorkin prior to the pair leaving for Morocco that she, Williams, would be leaving on a certain date, and that Williams, in fact, left Morocco on that date, and Sorkin was not sad or depressed at the time that she left. Williams alleges that the portrayal in these scenes are defamatory because Williams is falsely portrayed as a fair weather friend who abandoned Sorkin when she was alone, depressed, and in trouble in Morocco and who needed help and support. Uh, Williams claims that these are negative personal traits or attitudes that Williams did not hold. Another set of interesting allegations has to do with the program's treatment of the charges from Williams and Sorkin's Morocco trip on Williams company credit card. The program portrays Williams as not being entirely upfront with her employer, Vanity Fair, about the charges. In fact, in the program, there is an exchange between Williams and one of her supervisors where Williams is portrayed feigning knowledge of the outstanding charges. Essentially, Williams is portrayed as lying to her employer. Williams states that this is a false statement and or attribution in that she never lied to her employer about this charge but rather she voluntarily told her employer that a large personal charge had been placed on her business Amex and that she accepted responsibility for it. So before the court even gets into the question of whether William's portrayal is defamatory, the court would first have to determine whether her portrayal was substantially true. If the court determines that a statement or portrayal is substantially true, that's the end of the defamation and false light claim. It's only after the court determines that the statements or the portrayals were not substantially true that the court would consider whether the statement or portrayals are statements of fact or the dramatized opinion of the producer. In deciding whether a statement is substantially true, courts typically compare the language or portrayal with the actual truth to determine whether the truth would have a different effect on the mind of the average reader or viewer. Taking the allegations in the complaint is true, that Williams did not say or act in the way she is portrayed in the series. I think the court would not find the various complained of portrayals as being substantially true. I agree with you, Josh. I think just based on the complaint, uh, a court would have a tough time finding these portrayals as being substantially true. Um, Williams' portrayal in the series was commented by, on by a few media outlets. In an article entitled Inventing Anna has a brutal vendetta against Rachel Williams, is Netflix bitter that she sold her story to HBO? That's a long title for a story. The Independent wrote, quote, inventing Anna really, really wants us to hate Rachel Williams. Williams features as a character in Inventing Anna, a show which seems hell-bent on making her out to be the worst person in the world. And the New York Post wrote, uh, Quote, Shonda's most insane move, however, is treating poor Vanity Fair photo, photo editor Rachel Williams like she's the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, the complaint also alleges that as a result of Netflix portrayal, Williams was subjected to substantial online abuse and negative in-person interactions and negative characterizations in the press and podcasts. The complaint includes a rep representative sample, but notes that Williams has received thousands of similar abusive messages. The allegation is that if Williams was not falsely portrayed in this manner, she would not have been subjected to this type of negative treatment by the public. If a statement or portrayal is not truthful, then the next question would be whether an average reasonable viewer watching the scenes in their original context would conclude that they are statements of fact and not dramatized opinion of the producer.
The Ninth Circuit believes that viewers of this type of programming know that they are more fiction than fact. However, New York does not go this far. In Fairstein versus Netflix, the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York declined to conclude that viewers of When They See Us would assume the program is more fiction than fact, but rather that the dialogue and the dramatization is not a verbatim recounting of the real life participants, but is intended to capture the essence of their words and deeds. According to the Fairstein Court, the key to determining the difference between non-actionable statements of opinion and actionable statements of fact, or an opinion that implies that it is based upon fact which justify the opinion, is the implication that the statement is based on undisclosed facts known only to the defendants. So, is Williams' portrayal the unactionable, dramatized opinion of the producers, or is her portrayal based on, or would it appear to the average reasonable viewer to be based on, undisclosed facts known only to the producers? The producers included a very conspicuous disclaimer at the beginning of every episode. The disclaimer generally states, this story is completely true, except for all the parts that are total bullshit or totally made up. Usually disclaimers give the producer some room to claim that a work or parts of a work are dramatized opinion. However, as the United States District Court for the Central District of California pointed out in Goprin Dashville versus Netflix, which is the Queen's Gambit defamation suit, the presence of a disclaimer is a factor in the analysis, albeit not a dispositive one. Uh, that's right, Josh. In that case, the court found that Gopran Dashville had pled sufficient facts to support her defamation claim. And the court reminded Netflix that works of fiction are not immune from defamation suits if they disparage real people. The distinction between fact and opinion is an issue of law for the courts. And the determination will be based on the court's assessment of how the statement would be understood by an average person exposed to the statement in its full context. I think it's possible that the court will find that as to some of the depictions, especially scenes in which Williams is portrayed as less than truthful and forthcoming with Vanity Fair, the average viewer would not have a reason to conclude that such actions reflect the dramatized opinion of the filmmakers, and such a viewer could fairly conclude that the depiction was based on undisclosed facts known to the defendants. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that, Josh. Um, I think it's especially true with regard to those scenes where she is portrayed as being a, um, a uh, I don't know, somewhat less than ethical employee. Um, let's look at the remaining elements as I think they somewhat run together. Um, so the remaining elements are, um, does her portrayal, is her portrayal actually false or create a false impression about her? Are they highly offensive to a reasonable person or are they defamatory and are they made with actual malice? I think the media stories on the negative depiction of Williams and the evidence of the hatred being aimed at her online establish that a false impression uh, was made of her and that this false impression was highly offensive to a reasonable person. As for actual malice, Williams would have to show that Netflix de uh, de deliberately portrayed her in the way that they did in the hopes of insinuating a defamatory import to the viewer or that Netflix knew or acted in reckless disregard as to whether or not the portrayal of Williams would be interpreted by the average viewer as a defamatory statement of fact. The complaint has a separate section devoted entirely to establishing actual malice. According to the complaint, the production had hired a researcher whose job it was to investigate the Sorkin story and provide the research to the writers. Shonda Rhimes, the executive producer and creator of the series, explained in an interview, we were telling a story that was based on fact, so we needed a document to build an extensive timeline of events to dig into little things that we weren't even sure were going to matter. For this particular show, having someone who has read every transcript of the trial who was playing, paying close attention to every detail in Anna's life was really, really important because we wanted to know what we were thinking. We wanted to know what we were making up. We didn't want to be making things up just for the sake of it. She added, we wanted to intentionally be fictionalizing moments versus just accidentally fictionalizing them. The complaint also points to the fact that uh, the New York Post article upon which the series was based does not contain any negative portrayals of Williams. Also, the fact that Williams had published her Vanity Fair article and her book, My Friend Anna, prior to the um, writing of the series.
It also appears that Williams' attorney sent Netflix two letters before the show's production expressing concerns that Williams would be portrayed falsely. And based on the complaint, it seems like uh, Williams' concern was uh, well-founded, but it also seems like Netflix was on notice. So Netflix, as we know, does not shy away from these types of lawsuits. And if what they have done in previous uh, pieces of litigation is an indicator. I expect Netflix is going to hit back hard. I assume that Netflix is going to argue that the portrayals are substantially true and they'll probably come up with evidence or testimony later on in the case, I mean, trying to establish that they are true. And they'll also argue, obviously, to the extent that they're not true, they are the producer's dramatized opinion. So we're just going to have to see where this case goes. Thanks for sharing, Scott. This is interesting. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for tuning into this installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel. And if you have a good review, please be sure to leave that review. If it's bad, don't worry about it. And if you like our content, be sure to visit our website at theiplawblog.com. Thanks. Thanks.